Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future for everyone who lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya, a project manager by profession, and I'm interested and I've learned about circular economy and hope to see a world in which we convert from a linear to a circular space. And I'm Mike, I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a passion for social and environmental sustainability. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we can create a world that is not just sustainable, but the one that thrives. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia, as well as First Nations people across the globe. Today's topic for the podcast is about circular economy. We would like to introduce today's guest, Noelia Castro from Argentina. She has completed her bachelor's in international relations and master's degree in public administration. She has a deep interest in sustainability and sustainability practices and works as a trainer. Hello, welcome again, Noelia. Thanks for joining us on this podcast today. Hey guys, thank you for having me. So today's topic, we are trying to talk about the circular economy. Maybe we could start by defining what it means. Yeah, so when we talk about circular economy or regenerative economy, we are talking about like a comprehensive approach to resource management that aims to minimize waste, make the most of resources and promote sustainability. So it involves designing products for longevity, encouraging reuse and repair, recycling materials, and creating closed loop systems. Why is it so important that we had to think about the circular economy today? Michael, could you talk about what our current uh, system looks like? Yeah, so traditionally, um, you know, uh, throughout society, we've tended to use the traditional linear economy approach. And obviously that has uh, significant impacts on both the environment and as well as society in fact and if we look at that there's a you know uh, it's it's a matter of basically using and or extracting raw materials from the earth um uh, processing them into goods but eventually disposing them back as waste and uh even um obviously this has a huge uh, impact on environmental sustainability but also um even socially if we look at uh, the the huge impact on so the global south in particular, you know, countries uh, within Africa and other and other regions like in Southeast Asia, um, there, there's a huge amount of waste disposal, and the, where where we don't see the the circular economy approach in place, and uh, particularly the global south is, is is more adversely affected than than wealthier developed countries. But yeah, as as mentioned, obviously the most primary issue is the, the huge environmental impact, and we see with the circular economy approach, it basically is a large component of what adheres to now the sort of academic approach of a regenerative economy, which is, uh, I suppose, uh, which is actually part of the Thrive Framework. It's a foundational focus factor. And it's looking to, you know, obviously address um, the way in which the economy runs with in alignment with uh, preserving uh, natural ecosystems and ensuring the natural world isn't uh, facing the same traditional extraction-based approach and, and the impacts there. Uh, and, and the waste uh, impact disposal approach that had been the case, and as well as the, the social impacts, and um, they, these link to other uh, uh, aspects of um, sustainability approaches more broadly as well. It's good to think of it as regenerative because sometimes when you talk to people and say you're going from a linear to a circular and sustainable, they by default assume that you're asking us to use less products and just not have enough things. Are you expecting us to go back in your, and live in the forest? So like, what does it really mean? So I think a way of thinking of the regenerative economy is to say that we are in a bit of a crisis today and it requires us to regenerate what we have uh, as I think on one end resources, but also our economic systems need to rethink that can actually be sustainable for us and we I can still have a thrivable life. So I think that's a good, I think, move. And academically, I know it, it probably defines a lot more things, but I think from a day-to-day perspective as well, it, it's good to have that word and not look at circular economy as something that's limiting to us. But are there any other benefits of, you know, why do we need to care about a circular economy and what are the benefits of and following that approach? Uh, I'll just quickly, yeah, mention, uh, yeah, just link to what I what was um, alluding to before. So, uh, I mean, for example, the, the uh, European Commission, I think it was a, a number of years ago, but had projected that having adopting a regenerative economy approach 
had the capacity to cut um, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon footprint by 48% within a decade and a half of, of when that study was conducted. So that's just one example. But it also links to other areas like approaches to sustainability, like uh, strong sustainability, and looking at the ways in which the traditional approach had, had, had perceived that uh, natural capital and plundering the earth and the impact upon natural capital being substitutable for, for manufactured was okay. And the strong sustainability approach sees that natural capital cannot be substituted for, for manufactured because, you know, there, there is a, a finite resource there. And without it, extraction um, supersedes or exceeds um, regeneration. Obviously, there, there's a real issue there for, for sustainability. Regenerative pr approach for natural areas, and again, that just links to things like finite resources. You know, we look at deforestation or we look at, um, uh, you know, plundering the oceans or whatever it is um, for, for whatever uh, industry. And we need to make sure that things are done within the, that sort of, um, you know, the environmental and social parameters or the environmental um, environmental ceiling and social floor, or, or, or was it vice versa, uh, to, to ensure that things fall within those planetary boundaries, but to make sure that, yes, yeah, so a strong sustainability is adhered to the finite, the, there is the recognition that there are finite resources and a regenerative, a regenerative economy basically um, allows for this and, and seeks to preserve the natural world and social interests within those parameters. Yeah, and I also believe that we want to think of a more uh, direct benefit for us as individuals. We can also mention the economic benefits that this um, economy has. But for example, cost savings. So we can um, repair and repurpose items instead of constantly buying new ones can lead to cost savings for individuals. Uh, we can also support local economies because by participating in local sharing economies or buying second hand can contribute to the businesses, communities. And it can also empower us because if we engage in a circular economy, uh, we can take control of our consumption habits um, and we can encourage a more conscious and responsible choices, you know? And it provides, I believe, an opportunity uh, for individuals to learn more about the life cycle of products, the environmental impact of their choices, and yeah, how we can make a positive difference. And I think, uh, like you mentioned, in terms of empowering, it's also, there's also something empowering about actually knowing how a product you have in hand works, how to fix it, what does it mean, because we live in an I think a world today where there are each of us own so many things, every small pen that you use to, you know, a, a computer or a printer, there's so many items that we have, but there is a sense of control and actually knowledge that we also build as individuals. And, and speaking of the economy, I think even from a business perspective, there is benefits on one hand that you, it looks at, you have to recover the items that you can actually get those items you put into manufacturing a product and bring it back in the cycle so you can have a known or a consistent line of raw materials coming back to you. It doesn't have to go back into an extractive uh, space where every time you need a new uh, metal, you don't you know, go back into uh, trying to find a mine that can dig it out versus you could probably have that product be sent back to you in the loop after it's been used well. Um, so there is benefits that way. There's also, I think, in general... Uh, socially today, there is more acceptance and more and more uh, youngsters especially are drawn towards brands that are, uh, I think, socially conscious and also uh, trying to help save the uh, environment. So I think in that way you also have attraction growing towards um, a business that's keeping its, itself updated. And as an economy, I think it's such a big opportunity, I feel, for for so many innovators to think of different ways of doing, I think since maybe the industrial revolution and maybe since the technologies, uh, digital technologies have come in, there's not been the biggest you know, evolution in terms of so many products being made. And today, this is an opportunity for anybody to think of ways of doing. So I think there are other benefits as well that we could get into. Um, I was wondering, you know, as proceeding forward, when we think of economy, it sounds like a big, you know, thing and it's not something that individuals can fix just by ourselves. Um, 
just you need governments, you need policy and regulators. Uh, but we are also the consumers. We create the demand for a product. We then consume it and use it in a specific way. And then we are the ones who are holding it and throwing it at the end of the day. So it might be important, like you know, earlier you mentioned, to understand the loop, like the whole life cycle that a product goes through. So maybe we could spend a little bit of time discussing what are those different stages of life cycle of a product and then see what, you know, how, how is it different in a circular economy at these stages and what is something that we need to probably know um, to, to play a better part as either an innovator or a consumer uh, of a product. Um, so maybe I could begin with just trying to simplify a, a, a process of the regenerative process by just saying, you know, we have raw materials, um, which is an input, and then you have the processing of it, whether it's manufactured and then, you know, put into packages, etc. And then we have distribution and used by us as a third stage. And then we finally have the waste stages. So if you just look at it simply, I guess it's four stages. Um, it's how can a product in all its four stages be sustainable and actually close the loop of not having, I guess, a wastage and uh, be regenerative. Um, so maybe we could start with an example. Um, I was thinking of coffee uh, as a simple thing, which I guess most people do drink or at least would be conscious of. Um, I think firstly, if you think about raw material stage, coffee is a, a natural, um, you know, it grows from the soil. Uh, we don't manufacture it in a factory. However, I think there is a land that we use for um, growing that coffee. So maybe the first step is to think about where does the land that we use for coffee come from? And what are the other questions would, would a circular economist, for that example, or a regenerative economy specialist think of? Yeah, I think with the example of coffee, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question clearly enough, but I think we have the, when we talk about the raw uh, the raw material itself and then the processing there there is obviously factors considering like the workers themselves working in those conditions that's one aspect of it but in terms of the circular economy more more clearly it's obviously that in terms of the supply chain the uh in distribution so the processing you know the amount of say water use the amount of uh and so forth in in that process uh when it comes to distribution and usage obviously in terms of transportation and the, you know the carbon footprint and plastic use and then when we talk about the, the waste you know this is obviously where the circular economy yeah, as most people would probably consider would come into play with you know recycling or how uh, adherent to a circular economy approach that is if it can be recycled or if these are disposable and just end up as waste so i think obviously they're the different um areas i think you'd have to consider um yeah from extraction phase right through to uh the waste and i think you know the cups that are used when someone orders a takeaway coffee that's just a, a good example of waste um as opposed to say you know using a, a coffee mug then when we talk about the coffee beans themselves and the processing and the transportation of them you know we're, we're talking about you know uh the carbon footprint and, and the way ways in which to mitigate that as well as the processing of the coffee itself so I suppose all of those different areas come into play with with a circular economy and regenerative economy approach uh, that need and they all need to be considered. Yeah, not to mention that actually you can reuse the coffee grains that you use for the coffee. You can make compost with that. You can uh, use it for the plants for a better growing. As a natural material, I think it's even easier to think about what you could do with it. But when you think of circular economy, there could be other products, and the idea is to. I think be more conscious, I guess, to, okay, when you have to think about how does the waste go, where does it go? Um, does it go into the soil? Does it go into the water? Is it a toxic material? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's one aspect. And going like maybe back to like land and usage of land, even for something like coffee growing, maybe you need to know if these are, are there more and more lands being taken out just to grow coffee, for example, maybe not for coffee, but maybe for palm oil and parts of the well, that's what's happening. So then you think about the product that you use and then is it being just forest being cut off just to make land to grow something? And then once you're growing, are you is that actually affecting the soil, maybe um, quality or degradation uh, because of what you're planting in that, in, in that space instead of um, what there should be? Does it affect any natural environmental conditions or you know, if, if it affects how forests are protected, for example? Um, just thinking of how is your product 
having some kind of an impact uh, while even in the extractive phase before you even get into the next step. It's being processed. I think most often coffee is pretty, pretty good because it's probably dried out and then, you know, they, they extract the coffee, grind it, and the beans come out and they're roasted for a little while. So there's a bit of energy consumption during the stage of the processing. Um, and then they move into the, the distribution. And I think packaging, for example, might be a good, good topic for us to think about. A coffee, for example, is packaged in, you know, different ways. The materials you use, the design of those packages uh, do have an impact uh, because in most parts of the world, I don't think that they grow coffee per se. Uh, Michael, for example, in Australia, we don't grow coffee as much as I know, and it's all imported, but it's an extremely high coffee-consuming uh, culture, at least in the cities. And that makes it... Uh, something that you need to be then conscious about is your packaging. Um, yeah. Are there any other uh, interesting examples of maybe packaging that we could think of, like products that are designed so they can be regenerated in the right way? I think um, just a good example of, of an approach, but also it links, in fact, to the um, sort of uh, the raw materials as well, but also to the packaging is when there are different innovations to, to do with things like algae-based plastics. So, uh, where it's you know biodegradable and and it doesn't have the same impact of you know plastic, you know microplastics and so forth. And um, so you look at you say as a raw material, and uh, say seaweed or algae harvesting, which has a huge uh, so let's say it's a much more even at the production stage or the ex, um, if it's say farmed uh, compared to say other sources of agriculture, you know so um, say seaweed or or algae based farming. Um, you know, it doesn't require water use. It doesn't re require fertilizer. So even at the sort of raw material stage, it's more environmentally friendly. And there's carbon sequestration. You know, so it's so it's whilst being farmed is actually help assisting the environment in many ways. In many ways, uh, addressing the, the carbon footprint. But there's also um, it has that benefit if it, if utilized to things like uh, plastic use. So. If that can can be used in the context of like plastic packaging, you know that could be a benefit. But just that's another example of um, obviously uh, if, if there are innovations like that that even from the raw material stage can be used to mitigate issues connected to say plastic you know packaging and and the ways in which materials are used for uh, supplying products you know on supermarket shelves etc. Um, I think you know that that's a win win. Uh, sort of, you know, across the board of, of from uh, both, you know, the raw material right, right to the distribution stage and, and waste stage. So I think um, th that's a good example. Yeah, I also believe that while we're talking about coffee, uh, there's a few coffee houses that instead of using cups, they are giving edible cups. So you can eat them and there's another way there to avoid waste, you know? I think that's very innovative. That's very cool. I don't think I've I've seen that before. Taps into the consumption aspect. How we consume a product is also something to think about. For somebody who's manufacturing a product, they would have to be conscious very clearly in terms of design. And I think the design thinking approach, as well as a lot of product designers today, are more obsessed about how a product is used. And when you think about sustainability, that says that how can we recover materials from it easily? Can they repair it themselves if they're handed over? For example, there are modular phone brands um, that you know can can help you replace any piece of the phone, and it won't keep you behind because of the fact that okay, you can just replace your space, um, you know, RAM space, and you can find ways of doing it. Uh, there are, I think, certain brands like Fairphone which provide you access to a lot more modular devices and a longer lifetime versus even I think phones these days are meant to last two years or so and not all of the materials are well recovered per se so it probably makes sense to do that but we also have um, a huge focus today on e-waste recovery um, just finding the metal and sending it back to the source so you find a whole set of people who are just into Finding that waste, um, then processing it, having plants where they bring them together, metals, and then you become a reseller of those metals back into the industry which created the product. So if it's a phone that requires metals. And this is a way we keep things in the loop and keep using the materials we already have in our system and we've produced so much of versus throw them away into the oceans and other places and then digging into the world. 
Um, so I think like circular economy or I think regenerative economy today looks at every part of the production and life cycle and then sees, okay, do we need to rethink this aspect so that it's more, I think one environmentally conscious, but also fair practice. Are there any other like solutions or, or the way to tr transition from a uh, linear to a circular economy? One is a rethinking of our mindset of what it, each stage of a product's process is. What are the other things that, that you think that individuals can do, but also maybe innovators can do, um, or even governments or policies can? Yeah, I think it's really important to look at, sort of as discussed. I mean, you look at um, just another example is, uh, you know, look at, say, uh, different supermarkets within Australia who are now using uh, recyclable bags uh, provided, let's say, which is 70%, I think, at least, uh, paper, uh, recycled paper, you know, compared to the plastic bag usage, which obviously was not adherent to uh, circular economy at all, or encouraging people to use re re reuse other other bags uh, is, is another example. But in terms of innovative approaches, I think it is uh, worth, like, important to look at the both the raw material stage uh, in, in and of itself and people to be aware of that you know, the, the extraction approach. And that's obviously where things like renewables come in and to be, you know, much more mindful about. And, you know, obviously with you know, oil and gas for energy, which, you know, it still is dominant within society. Um, you just look at, uh, you know, wind power, solar power, but also looking at um, even internationally where, uh, in particular, even developing countries where they can use uh, sort of natural natural uh, factors to their advantage i think in parts of north africa there's been huge innovation with uh with solar power uh technology because you know it, it, there's a huge amount of sun obviously somewhere like australia has that capacity too and then where we talk about um, uh, areas you know living on coastlines even many developing countries which have, have coastal regions and then we're talking about things like offshore wind power and utilizing the sort of um you know offshore wind as a means to generate um, so you know uh, uh, energy, but it also has the economic interests and benefits for those developing countries, but obviously you know developed countries as well. And I think if you just compare that to uh, certain uh, practices, uh, different industries which by default you know are are extractive, whose entire operations are you know not let's say sustainable, and there are um, uh, environmental impacts as a consequence so we can look at that um obviously we can see that with aspects of oil and you know oil and gas in in themselves in, in plundering the earth but so animal agriculture is another area obviously and not just in deforestation but things like waste runoffs and, and things like that and obviously um it's good when there are other innovations that come in which uh can let's say substitute or uh yeah, as mentioned, things like the, the algae or seaweed farming, which is probably one of the better ways alongside other renewable uh, innovations like, um, yeah, solar power and wind power, which should be expanded. And even if there can be uh, suggestions of, say, with uh, wind power, that the, there can be examples where there might be some ecosystem damage or whatever where, when these are constructed, but generally that needs to all be considered as part of that, as part of the way in which uh, energy and uh, resources are used across the board, including for, for green technology. But um, obviously that that part is uh, something that needs to be strongly uh, considered as well. Yeah, I actually do believe that we should mention that the fact that companies and governments are the ones that should leave lead the engagement in circular economy but i mean mainly because of the influence they have the the investment the the resources that they they have they can use it and implement them in large scale changes you know but i also believe that it's a complementary effort you know by us individuals adopting circular practices we can create the demand for sustainable products and services, which will encourage companies and governments to adopt more circular business models and incentivize maybe um, the adoption of policies. Absolutely. And I think even for governments, like you put into power people who align with these areas of work. So eventually there are representatives who can make those changes as well. Yeah, I completely agree that I think we are on the demand side of things. Um, 
if we would thirty years ago, nobody would have believed that the vegan movement would be so big. But if you look at the world over today, restaurants that you would ne- or countries you would never imagine would have probably vegan options do have now. And it sounded very absurd when somebody brought it up, you know, many years ago. But today, that's so common. It shows that there is a demand, and that there the businesses, the economy responds back to that, and we have a big role to play. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, and I think. Um... It's about uh, yeah consumers as well, uh, not just lobbying uh, governments and calling governments to account, but um, but you know making choices with their wallets as well and being more informed about what they purchase and um, how sustainable the product is. Not just the company, but you know the what the what what the product itself is if it if it can be at all uh, sustainable. Some things are going to be more sustainable than than others, but obviously as well as that um, the way in which things are, are manufactured and distributed also. One other thing I think in terms of opportunities for individuals and even small businesses, I think is something that we should probably look at. We usually look at economy as big companies running, you know, major operations. But individuals and groups, even those not with, I guess, a high amount of education or skills can learn to work in a regenerative economy because many items that need to be recovered waste from gives employment to people. It helps you build skills in a different way. Design is a big aspect of how we make products today. And I think that remains uh, an aspect that we can also think of. Um, if it could be a very small aspect, things from 3D designing today gives you products as easily as, as you could and make something that fits your need rather than shipping it from um, so many kilometers away and adding some kind of uh, an impact on it. So I think there's so much more that we could probably look at as individuals, but I'm almost out of time, unfortunately. But uh, are there any other ideas or solutions that um, will help in the transition towards this economy? Yeah, I just think, um, you know, uh, the public just being more and more aware and listening to perhaps credible sources on uh, the, the sustainability of things. There can be a lot of misinformation out there as well. So I think um, just having that awareness beyond even just recycling, obviously recycling is part of it, but, um, you know, a huge part of it and uh, using, you know, recyclable materials, but uh, obviously, you know, to look at uh, products across the board and, and what, 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 what products are used. And there's a, there's a lot of information about that. There's a lot of misinformation too, but just to, for people, the public, I suppose, to be aware of the, the amount of misinformation and usually that tends to try to smear claims about how sustainable uh, very dominant um, our products actually are so often those that are very dominant and have a have had a lot of impact uh, are still needing to be uh, you know reconsidered and questioned and when there's a lot of let's say defense and dismissal of allegations against them I think the public should be kind of wary um, about defending those products and seeing them as sustainable or dismissing claims that they aren't sustainable so yeah I think public education is a big part of it I hope this uh, conversation for all of you also was 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 a good just an introduction of what, what it means to be in circular economy and what it would take um, and what we could start doing today as we hold more governments accountable um, so thank you so much Noelia and Michael for joining um, I hope we could uh, catch up in the future more online and offline about this topic thank you again for having me yeah thanks Noelia thanks Kavya and uh, we'll put as many social as we have from this conversation into the description notes and um, hope to see more people back into the podcast and keep on traveling.